snap at me and act like that. <laughs> <He's like laughs> check, check, check. There it is. Okay. For those of you who don't know, that's Sam, our son, back there. I don't talk to anybody like that. <laughs> well, good morning. What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord together. Amen. Yesterday, our back room was full of women, um, some that we knew and some that we didn't know, and we had a great time in the Lord, and we had a wonderful word from a friend of mine, and then Terry Wise from the um, Vacaville Church of God, she came up and led worship. So it was just a sweet time with, with all the women here. I want to tell you a story about what happened yesterday because it's going to kind of go with, with what we're going to talk about today. So while I'm doing that, if you would turn to James chapter 1, verse 12. I'm usually a pretty confident person when it comes to things that I'm comfortable in. Can we all just agree that when you're comfortable with something, you've done it a hundred times, you can have all the confidence in the world when you do something like that. What I didn't realize, I think, when I um, did the women's lunch was that was outside of my wheelhouse. And this is why. I can decorate like nobody's business. So making that look beautiful for the women was my joy and my honor. Now the cooking, however, caused me a challenge because it's not my favorite thing to do. I could do it, but it's not my favorite thing because I, I was worried. Am I going to have enough? What if I don't have enough? What if I burn this and I have people helping me, you know, cook my Terry from Vacaville? Um, <laughs> she was running along cleaning up behind me because I kind of destroy as I create. I don't know. Thank you, John. <laughs> so, I, I, did, I, was doing, I was hitting my stride, I was doing good, and then we started getting hot in the kitchen. So I thought, oh, I'll just go turn on the air. And I didn't know, we've been here a year and a half, I didn't know where to turn on the air conditioner at. So I looked around for the box, and I turned the box on, and it, and it still wasn't cooling off. And then Terry needed to do a sound check. I didn't know how to turn on the sound. I didn't know where the light switches were in the sanctuary. And I started really realizing even more than ever before how it takes a team to get things done, right? I come into the sanctuary and it feels cool. I don't ever think about it. I, the lights are on. I didn't know where those were. And, so, and I didn't know at all how to run that thing. And Terry wanted words, and I'm like, we got to find somebody else. I knew the on button. And so <laughs> I didn't know anything else. And I just, I was feeling frustrated with myself because I didn't know these things, and I felt like I should have known these things. But yet I felt the Holy Spirit quicken my heart and how everybody has a job of somehow to be part of a family, right? So although it's good for me to know those things, it was also good for me to call for help, which Kevin never picked up his phone. <laughs> which meant I called Kevin. He was busy, I'm sure, doing something. I'm like, I don't know what to do, and I couldn't get a hold of John, so... Then we just started problem solving, and I started going around turning on all the lights to see what worked with what. So I learned a lesson. I could ask questions. I don't have to know everything, and everything still worked out. But it takes a team. Okay. James 1.12. Blessed is the one her, who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So if we think about it for a minute, what, is, what does the word blessed mean? And, and John and I had a conversation this morning about what it means. And, and it, it literally means to be unbound, unbound excuse me, to be set free. So somebody who is not blessed is cursed. And if you're cursed, you're bound up. You don't have freedom. When you are blessed, you have been set free. You can lay before the Lord. You can do the things that God calls you to do. And when you are un not cursed anymore, then it's going to open your ears to hear what the Lord is saying to you. And when you're walking after him, we can truly say we are blessed. Right? So blessed are you. If you're not work, walking underneath the curse, and if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you are blessed. 
If you have embraced the work of the cross, then you are blessed. That's right. It also means to be happy and have a self-contained peace and joy. So what that means is self-containment is that it's inside you. You have the peace of God. It's self-contained inside you no matter what is going on around you. Does that make sense? Your life can be exploding. Things can be going wrong, yet you have the peace of God the Father. Because where your hope lies. I was wondering, you know, when we... When we go through life, there's always storms, right? There's always challenges that, that we go through and that sometimes we need to stand firm. Well, we always need to stand firm and not be blown here or there. And, and the Lord reminded me of a cartoon that we had watched probably a couple of years ago. And there was a little purple character. I couldn't remember the name of the cartoon. But the little character would go, I raise my hands in the air like I just don't care. And I know some of you, yeah, I see some of you know it. Is that what you do when your life starts going crazy? Are you putting your hands in the air like you just don't care? Because why? Where does our hope lie? In Jesus, in God. And yeah, things don't look good and they don't feel good. But we're going to put our hands in the air because we don't care what the world says and what the enemy says. We know where our hope comes from and what God says. That is persevering. That is standing firm, you guys, not being swayed with what our eyes tell us is happening. Or do you bury your head in the sand and you give up hope because you see no way out? I know some of you do that because I do that, and I'm not any more special. Things can look bad and dire sometimes, and I can start getting in my own flesh. And when I start getting in my own flesh, I start trying to fix things myself, is when I am not standing firm, and I am not trusting God. Several years ago, John and I lived in Millville with our two of our kids. Sam was not, had not blessed our lives yet. And um, it was a little makeshift house that the man who owned the property was a trailer that he built a house around a trailer. I don't know. It was super funky. It was ugly on the outside, and I loved it because that's just, I don't know. I loved it. I loved being out there in the boonies. And, um, but like a collector like I am and an artist, we need a little more space to put stuff. So my dad had called one day and said, I'm getting rid of this shed. Do you guys want the shed? I'm like, yeah, I want the shed. So John and his brother went over and took apart the shed and brought it over to our house. And, and I was in, inside minding my own business because they don't need me to tell them how to do it. So I'm inside, and pretty soon John comes in, and he looks exasperated to me. And I was like, well, how'd it go out there? And he said, well, there's half a coffee can full of nuts and bolts left and and Mike said we're done and I said don't we need all those put back in there <laughs> I mean it seems like when it came to the house all of those needed to go back in there and John said I looked at Mike and I said uh don't we need to have these all? oh no he says no it's gonna hold it'll be fine Literally, when you looked at the frame of it, every six inches, there was, there was some type of fastener through the whole thing. And it was double long. It was 16 feet long. Yeah, it was two sheds put together. So this is a substantial shed that I was looking forward to filling with stuff. So John said to his brother, I sure hope that that doesn't fall apart the first time a wind comes by. Oh, no, it's not. And see, the deal was if my brother-in-law helped John put that shed together, I was going to make him um, tri-tip. So I was already making the tri-tip for a job that was halfway done. So I was like, well, you know, he must know better. You know, I was trying to keep, keep up the good front. So spring came, summer came, everything was fine. The normal things happened inside that shed, a rattlesnake, a... <laughs> You know, spiders, cockroaches, all that stuff that can get in. But then came a storm. 
uh, there was hurricane winds. I don't know if you guys remembered it. It was early 90s. And we heard in the middle of the night an explosion. And b- it was because the, the shed was also up against the house. Probably not a good idea, but it was. And we heard <laughs> this big thing. And, and we both woke up and looked at each other. And John said, I think it's the shed. <laughs> and we came out around there. And the shed was blown to smithereens. It looked like there was nothing left standing, a pile of. And the first thing out of my mouth was not nice about my brother-in-law. You know, there stood the coffee can, not spilled or anything with all of the nuts and bolts in there, but there was nothing left of that shed. And I was reminded of that this morning. Pardon me? The stuff was the stuff was in there ruined. Except that that guitar that Kevin fixed for me was in there. So thank you, Kevin. The shed fell apart because it didn't have everything that it was created to have. Every place that needed to have a nut and bolt when it was created and it came to my dad's house had what it needed to be strong to stand the test of time. I want you to think about in your life when you're when everything seems to be being blown up and falling apart and maybe you are falling apart maybe you need to ask yourself what am I not having that I was created to have? Where am I not functioning and having faith in God when he's created me to do that, right? He's made a way for you and for me through the cross, through sending his son. And so my life can explode like that shed, and I could be laying in a heap, and I cannot be standing firm, and I'm not persevering in that moment. But unlike that shed, when you and I rise, and we get up, and we move forward again, that is when you begin to persevere. And there will always be times in your life and different things that will come against you where you may get knocked down. I'm not going to say may. You will get knocked down. But how long do you stay down? Are you down for the count? Where there's that referee counting one, two, three until he says you're done? Or do you get back up? And if you have to take more hits, you take more hits. But you take the hits knowing Who's your shield? You have your armor of God on, and you take the hit, and you stand firm. You say, "Uh uh-uh, in the name of Jesus, this is what I'm believing. I'm going to allow my eyes to deceive me. I'm not going to allow my eyes to deceive what God says about me and about you. We need to have tools in our toolboxes to help us persevere and stand. And in a moment, I'm going to give you some scriptures that I want you to write down. If you can, if you don't have anything to write those down, then I will give them to you um, after service. I want you to ask yourself this question in your walk with the Lord. Do you dare greatly? I'm not talking about truth or dare or doing something stupid. But I'm talking about when God says, I need you to do this, do you dare to do it? And do you dare to do it greatly because of who strengthens you and who tells you to do it and how he's making a way for you? Do you dare greatly? Theodore Roosevelt said the following. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who actually is in the arena fighting. Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. And who strives valiantly. Who errs. Who comes out short again and again. Because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds. Who knows great enthusiasms and great devotions. And who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows the end, that triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. 
so that it, his place shall never be with those cold and timid so souls who never know victory because they never tasted it. And you can't taste victory unless you've been defeated once in a while. If you, if you just always had victory, you know, if we see people who have charmed lives or whatever and they've never struggled, they don't really know the sweet taste of victory because they've never tasted defeat. But if you are somebody who always has defeat in your life and you haven't, you haven't um, strived with the Lord and you haven't pushed through with the Lord, then you don't taste victory either. And I want to be a person who fails and messes up and, be, and I'm defeated. But when God comes through because I stand firm, I can taste what victory is. And the Bible says that victory in the end, we already know it belongs to God. When it says that every knee is going to bow, that's victory. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's victory. So, yes, I've heard it said before that we all know the end of the story. We do. We're going to go be with the Lord, and he's going to be reign and be victorious. But when the rubber meets the road, we can think ahead. But in this moment, when everything in your life is falling apart, or maybe you have fear or doubt, or maybe you have something secretly that you are struggling with, I'm here to tell you God wants to set you free. Yeah. So. You've got sin. We all do. But the difference between being someone who is constantly walking in sin and someone who has experienced the sin yet gone to the cross with it is that you taste the victory and you don't stay where you are. Daring greatly for the Lord means that you make good and right choices, not the easy choices. Being a servant of God means you're making the good and right, righteous decisions for your life, not the easy decisions. It is easier to be a liar than to tell the truth when you're scared out of your mind what the truth is going to happen to somebody, what it's going to make somebody think about you. It is easier for you to be deceitful in your marriage than to, to really lay down the what your feelings are, and to be able to talk about them. It's scary. The easy way is to tell the lie. The easy way may be to cheat on your taxes, because, or an easy way may be to withhold your tithe. Oh, that's an ouchy one. But it may be the easy way in the moment so that you can pay that bill. But daring greatly means no matter what my eyes are telling me, I'm going to do what's right because God tells me what to do through his word, and I'm going to be obedient. Daring greatly to always do the right thing. To dare greatly in any circumstance means that we need to help have the tools to help us stand. And that's what the word is full of tools. So the first tool that we will need is reliance. We must rely completely and totally on God and what he says about us in any specific trial that we're going through. It means that we really have to know the word, you guys. And I want you to get beyond just Googling the word, Googling the scriptures. I really would like to see you guys have your Bibles in church. Sorry, John. My pers I know a lot of people do have their phones, but there's something about having the weighted word of God in your hands and you're turning those pages. Have your word with you. You have both. Okay. So here are some scriptures for that. Psalm 41, 46, sorry, 1 through 3. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. That's saying, if you or I are in trouble, who do I cover myself with, my own abilities, or do I go to the refuge and I put myself in the shadow of his wings? He is my refuge. He is my strength. When I step out of sight of when I step outside of that scripture and I become my own refuge and I become my own strength, or food becomes my refuge, or alcohol becomes my refuge, whatever it is that I put my faith in to comfort me and strengthen me in that moment will cause my death. And if it's not physical, it's gonna be spiritual. But the beauty of 
Father, the sending us the Son, died for us, is that I could, I could wake up in that moment and I can be so consumed and I stand up and say, Lord God, forgive me. And I step into the shadow of the Almighty God and I am now in the refuge of God the Father. That simple. We don't have to have a ritual that we go through. It's simply, God help me. I'm going to turn my back on this. And let's say next week I'm back in that again. I fall down and I'm back in, up in that. But I've tasted victory. In that moment, I step back into it. Lord, you are my refuge and my strength. Cleanse me. Strengthen me. You are my tower. And immediately, God is there. Forgiving. He doesn't make me pay a penance. He doesn't beat me up. His forgiveness is complete because of the work of the cross. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is our strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. When you are afraid, if you have to verbally say, I'm afraid, God, I'm running to you. And I'm not allowing my eyes to deceive me and my knowledge to deceive me. But I put my faith in you and who you are. Nehemiah 8.10 says, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is my strength. I've been reading a book um, by the martyrs. What was that? Voice of the Martyrs. I couldn't mem remember the name of it. And there's eight women that are now in the underground, the ch underground church in third world countries. Their stories are terrifying. We have no idea what people go through when we live here in America and we get to meet together. But I've been reading these testimonies of women who have lost their families, who have seen their children killed in front of them, who have lived in the jungles eating snails for the gospel, who have stood up and say, I will not denounce Christ. And the most amazing thing that I see that's a common thread between all of those women is that they know that the joy of the Lord is their strength. And they will not deny Christ because they run to him. He is their refuge and their strength. And it's amazing to me how even in my own life and right here in America, how we might not get a car that we wanted, then we think that God doesn't bless us because I didn't get the car I wanted or the job I wanted or uh, whatever it may be. I will equate God's love and blessing for things, not for the spiritual things that he has for me or you. Right? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not into your own understanding, for in all your ways submit to him, and he will be the one that makes your path straight. That means that when I'm struggling and I put my trust in the Lord and I stop leaning into my own understanding, I stop looking at the situation, I lean into him and what his word says, then all of the confusion about how I'm supposed to be taking care of things, he makes straight. This is the way you go, Ginger, because you've put yourself before me. You've acknowledged me. And I have prayed that prayer. Lord, I have acknowledged you. I am submitting my ways to you. Please make this way straight. And God shows me the way to go. When I get over myself. That's a hard word, you guys. We can be an arrogant people. I'm not saying anybody in this room specific. But we can. In general, we want to do things on our own. But when you are a follower of Christ, that means what? You are following Christ. The second thing you need, and these are not in any specific order, is definitely prayer. You have to be in communication with God. You just simply need to have a raw conversation with him. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to have big, flowery words. You don't have to go buy a devotional and read from that which you can, but God likes sloppy prayers. He likes it when you just pour out your heart to him. When I have a conversation with John, I don't take notes beforehand. 
and have to order it. A lot of times I talk to him and I'm frustrated and I'm upset. And it's the same thing with God. I have shook my face, fa- fist at God multiple times. I have been angry at him. And you know what? His love for me is so great that he could take it. He can take me saying, you've disappointed me. You have let me down. And what happens in that moment when I can get all that ugliness out is the Holy Spirit starts working in me, and then I say, oh, you didn't let me down. You are always faithful. It's me who took a wrong way, possibly. Conversation with God, prayer, talking back and forth with him. Philippians 4, 6 says to not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, by petition, and with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. There's a little bit of some instruction there. Did you hear the word thanksgiving? Last week I wrote something um, in my She Declares Facebook page, and I, and I just had it hard on my heart that the women that um, I was ministering to at that moment needed to really understand that God is not their sugar daddy. And that's a rough word. But when we approach God, give me, 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 that's when he is your sugar daddy. He doesn't want that relationship with you. And when my kids just want, 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 when they're younger, it eventually would get on my nerves. Thank God that his heart isn't like that. But he's given us instruction here in his word to approach God with thanksgiving. There is something in your life that you can be thankful for. And I bet if you really stepped back and took an inventory, there's a lot more than one thing. And I want to challenge you this week in your prayers and conversations with the Lord. Why don't, just in one of those times, everything be think about thanksgiving and gratitude? Why don't we try to not ask for anything and just tell him who he is? and why we are thankful for him, and why we love him, and why we serve him. We can get wrapped up in thinking that that every time we approach God, it's because we need to ask for something. But he's asking us to approach him with prayer, petition, giving thanksgiving. Psalms 145, 18 through 21 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him, and he hears their cries, and he saves them. And the Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he, des- he destroys. So do you see there's a, there's a definite contrast there. Everyone who loves the Lord and follows after him, he loves and protects, but the wicked will be destroyed. That's, again, the end of the story. We know. But I want to be in the will of God. And when I fall down, I get back up. When you fall down, I've seen you, I've seen some of you do this. You fall down, you get back up, and you put your nose to the grindstone again, and you keep on going. God honors that. And every time that you do that, it's going to be farther and farther and farther between when you fall in that same thing. But I'm going to tell you to be alert because the enemy will always check that door. He will always check that door to see, hmm, is it still locked by the blood of Jesus? Is she still standing firm in how God healed her and delivered her of this? And when he finds that he can't get back in and I'm still going, Who's tasting victory in that moment? God and me. The third thing you guys need to grasp on is faith. We have to stand firm knowing that God is going to move on our behalves. Even when it doesn't look like it. Even when it doesn't look like God is going to move in your life. Even when you don't feel like he has 
you have his favor. Even when this sister or that sister or that brother is getting more blessed than you, in your eyes, in that moment, are deceiving you. Your relationship with God is your relationship with God, right? I can't tell Melanie how to have a relationship with God. It's her, between her and God. I could show her the way. I could talk scripture with her. She can show me the way. But when the rubber meets the road, it's Melanie and God before that throne. She's responsible. I'm responsible for me. That's hard. Because I like to control. I like everything to be a certain way. But when I learn to take care of myself first, I'm a healthier woman, friend, mother, wife, servant of God. Because my heart needs to be right with God. So having faith means I'm standing there waiting for God to move. And sometimes it's not the way that I want him to move, right? Sometimes he meets my needs in a way that I, I didn't expect him to. And sometimes it's in a way I didn't want him to. A couple weeks ago, I was struggling with something, and a girlfriend of mine dropped a bomb on me. This is how you should be thinking about this. And again, I'm like, Wah. I should know better by now. I'm an old lady-ish. I should know these things. But I had to be realigned and reminded that my faith lies in God. Right? My faith cannot lie in anybody in this room. My faith cannot lie in my pocketbook, in my medical status, in the reports, in my children, in any of that. My faith lies in God alone. Alone. And when I fall down... My faith is what picks me back up. And I'm confident that the blood on the, on the cross that was shed for you and me is enough. And he covers me because I communicate with him. And I say, I'm having a hard time in this. So when he doesn't do what I think he should do, I stand and I have faith. We must persevere. We must keep forward going forward. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a video of a butterfly coming out of the cocoon. It's really an amazing, you can see it on YouTube, it's really an amazing process because the butterfly was once a caterpillar and overate for a long time, got chunky, got in the cocoon, and it began to turn into a butterfly. There's a video on there where you can watch a butterfly struggling to get out of its cocoon, and it's struggling for quite a while. And it shows that uh, you can see this man comes who's doing the video. He decides that he's going to help that uh, butterfly out of the cocoon. And so he took a little pair of scissors, and he kind of snipped away a little bit of the cocoon so the butterfly could get out easily. What happened is the butterfly then had half of its body was dormant and dead because another person went on and said, well, you killed that butterfly because you helped it in the struggle. And the whole reason that happened is when the butterfly is struggling to get out of that cocoon, the struggle is actually pushing the blood through all of the veins and into the wings to cause their color to happen and, and to also cause them to have strength. And when he cut that, that side of that butterfly that needed that struggle and that strength and that perseverance, it, half of it was dead. The struggle is where we become strong. If you believe because you know the Lord, it's all pretty sailing from here. Wake up! That's not going to happen. We're struggling to be who we're called to be. Things are hard. Things are scary. And it hurts sometimes. But God doesn't leave us alone, you guys. You struggle. You struggle and you push and you get forward. 
You struggle some more until you get free of the things that bind you and you're like that butterfly and you're ready to fly to the next thing. And then you'll struggle again and you'll struggle again. And every time that you keep on going, you're stronger for the struggle. I'm passionate about that. The struggle, stronger for the struggle. Because so many times in the church that I was raised in, if you had struggled, then you had sin somewhere in your life. And that's a wrong teaching. Because where are you putting the scripture where we're all born into sin then? Really? We all need the Savior. I don't care how good you are. We all need the Savior. And we all have struggles. The last tool that I want to talk to you about is to be in fellowship. It is critical that you are in church, that you are in fellowship with other believers who can struggle right alongside you. And sometimes you may be with somebody that struggles in the same areas with you and God can use each other, but more than likely he's going to put you beside somebody who's already walked through that and they can strengthen you and hold you up and love you for where you are. We are not a church that's going to sit in condemnation when the lost come through the wall, through that door. We're going to come alongside, and we're going to say, look, brother, we all have sinned, and it's because of the cross that we're here, and we'll work this out together. Being in fellowship with each other, whether it's in this building or it's at the house, you have people over to your house, or you're on Voxer or Marco Polo or whatever ways that you're communicating with each other. There is no excuses now because we can be in contact all the time. There's no more long distance phone bills with cellular. Reach out to each other. Come alongside each other. When we are in community together, it means we're watching each other's back. And if I see a sister struggling, I could come alongside her. If it was in the kitchen a couple days ago, and I could put my arm around her and say, are you having a rough day? Easy. I don't have to know all her stuff. But you're having a rough day? Let's just, let's just pray right now that the joy of the Lord just fills you. Right? Somebody can come to me and say, I see that your attitude is a little stinky. Because this week it was. I confessed it. I was cranky. Someone come alongside me and say, let's just pray together. I don't need to know why you're cranky. Let's just pray together. And the reason that can happen is why? Because I'm in community. Pastor John and I may be the shepherds here, but we are not perfect. We will never act like we're perfect. And if you think that we're struggling, boy, you better get praying for us. And you better come alongside us and say, I think, I think maybe we need to pray together. We pray for you. You pray for us. It's not an either or. We are children of God. And we're going in the same direction and to serve him. A community works together and watches each other's backs. It's much like that shed that exploded. We needed all those nuts and bolts and screws in that shed. Had they all been put in there, that shed would probably still be standing today. It is much like each one of us. You guys are nuts. And bolts. And screws. We all have a part to play here at Cornerstone. And then the bigger picture is we all have a part to play in the kingdom of God. And so when you are not present in my life or in this place, your, your absence is felt. And I don't say that to condemn you if you take a Sunday off. I say that to say that the presence of God in you and who you are as a child of God is needed in this place. So your absence is missed when you're not here. Still go camping and go fishing and do all the stuff you got to do. Not a lot on Sundays. That's a whole other thing. But I want you to still have family time. Those things are important. You are missed. Your nuttiness or your boltiness or whatever is needed here to make this place strong because we're growing. Have you took a look around? We're growing. You are needed and wanted. 
the verse goes on to talk about when you do this, that God will give you the crown of life. Some people say um, that the, that means that you'll live forever. That's a crown of life. But that really isn't what this passage talks about. It's a reward that God gives you for persevering. I see that you have run the way, race and you've got to the end and you have persevered and you are faithful. I want to be faithful. I want you guys to be faithful. And we can look around this room and some of you know each other's stories more than Pastor John and I do because you've been here years and years and you have been faithful to this house. You've been faithful to serving God. You've been faithful to each other. And we can look around and see, look at this people over here, how they have served God. And we can follow examples because we're a community. When someone gets saved or gets healed or gets deliverance, then we all as a family rejoice. Because we're a community. If one of us is hurting, we all should be hurting. Scripture says that. If one of us is crying as a body, we need to be crying out with that person. If one of us is struggling, we all should be praying for that person. To persevere. To stand firm. Life is rough. But God is tougher. Things stink. Sin stinks. But the presence of God is the oil of joy. He is the salve. He cures what ails you and me. As you grow in the Lord, he's going to start cleaning house. And he'll start showing you stuff that you don't need anymore that maybe you held on to and not knowing that it was contrary to God. The more you grow, the less tempting certain things are to you because you found your hope and your strength in the Lord. A while back, John and I watched, and if, this, if anybody likes this movie, I'm just going to tell you, I'm not sorry for what I'm going to say. We watched the Goonies. We used to watch Goonies when our kids were little. We watched it a couple months ago, and we were like, I do not know how many F words were in that. And John and I were like, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, we watched it when we were young. And I was like, oh, Sam, this is a good movie. I want to watch. And then I'm like, oh, oh. And for me and John, for us, no longer was that acceptable for us. I'm not saying if you do it, whatever. As I said, your relationship with God is your relationship with God. But my heart and John's heart felt like we had to make a stand for, for ourselves that, that that movie was not okay for us to watch anymore. That's just the way it is. And I'm not telling you that so that I'm holier than thou. I'm telling you that because God's going to show you things in your life that's individually that you need to surrender so that you can stand firm that it doesn't trip you up. Does that make sense? So when he reveals things to you, don't be afraid of it. Look at it as the struggle. You're going to get free to be able to do whatever he has next for you to stand firm, whatever that may be. It may be simply to not hear negative things come out of your mouth. It may be to not gossip. It may be to um, say good things about yourself. Somebody I love dearly the other day, I heard her say it twice. I'm so stupid. Wah! That made me irritated. I ignored it the first time. The second time when she said, I'm just an idiot, I was like, okay, <laughs> I have to say something right now. And I love you, and I know you're older than me, but what's the word got to say about who you are? It doesn't say you're stupid or an idiot. So you made a mistake. It's okay. So for her, what she's working on is not saying bad things about who she is and grabbing on to what God says about her. For another friend, it's for her not being critical of everybody that's around her. It can be simple things that God wants to clean up. It doesn't have to be a big deal. But for us to stand firm, you guys, as a body, we need to do that. We need to focus on what God has at hand for us, and we need to stand firm. 
We need to persevere and not turn tail running. We need to put our hands in the air because we just don't care because we know who the deliverer is in the situation. Put your hands in the air like you just don't care. So if that needs to be your motto, when the enemy comes knocking at your door or you're facing something that's scary, I put my hands in the air because I don't care because I know who my deliverer is. Amen to that. So with that said, because we are purposely having our elders and our pastors come and pray every Sunday, it's a purposeful thing that we're doing because it's scriptural and because it's needed. And because we want you guys to have that connection with some of the leadership and your brothers and sisters to pray over you, I want you to be bold and come forward. And there's no judgment here. No judgment. Because we're all in the same boat. We all need the Father. And you don't have to tell us what's going on because God knows. But if you want us just to stand around you, anoint you, and pray over you, we're all willing to do that. We're a church that prays, guys. And that doesn't mean just on Facebook. It means here in this house. So I'm going to ask um, Brother Gene and Pastor Cook to come up. And if anybody else would like to come up to agree in prayer. And then if you need prayer, you come on up. You just be bold and come on up for prayer.